Well, do you know where you'll be and what you'll be doing when there's a total solar eclipse tomorrow? You know, those two events back to back have caused some people to conclude that the world's coming to an end. I don't know if you think that. There was a letter that was sent to the church in Thessalonia shortly after the first letter to meet a new situation. And that new situation mainly was that these people had been given a forged letter. Someone forged a letter with Paul's uh, name on it, purporting to be from Paul, teaching them that the future day of the Lord had already begun and they were in the middle of it. Remember, Paul taught them about the day of the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the first 11 verses, he lays it out what the day of the Lord is and how it's going to uh, how it's going to play out. But someone had d- deliberately misrepresented his teaching and spread misinformation around. And so there were people in the church that were panicked because they thought that the day of the Lord had already begun. And yet Paul had taught them in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18, that prior to the day of the Lord, they would be raptured. So they would be exempt from the day of the Lord, which would include specifically that 70th week of Daniel, Jesus calls it the great tribulation. And so there was some confusion. The practical ramifications of that confusion was that there were some people in this church that thought that the end of the world was at hand. And so as a result, they stopped working. And uh, that created a, a real embarrassing situation. In verse 6, for instance, of chapter 3, Paul says, We command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. And he's talking about them quitting their jobs. He says, verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, and they become busybodies. They've been putting their nose in everyone else's business instead of taking care of their own business. And that's a problem. It was an embarrassing situation. So the letter, the second letter that we're looking at in Thessalonians, Paul wrote it to correct teaching and to also, as I just read, reprimand these idlers. But He doesn't begin with that. He begins with encouragement. Chapter 1, let me give you the outline of three chapters. Chapter 1, encouragement. Chapter 2, enlightenment. And uh, then chapter 3 is, and I just drew a blank in my head, and that is enablement, okay? Chapter 1, encouragement. 2, enlightenment. Chapter 3, enablement. We'll go over these after we pause a moment and pray. Let's do so. Heavenly Father, it's just really good for us to be here because we know that you have ordered our assembly here today. This is your doing, and we've come in your name. We've come to gather around you and to hear from your word. And so, Lord, let us not miss what it is that the Holy Spirit of God has to say to each one of us and uh, individually as well. Lord, put it in the hearts of your people to get into your word and to have your word get into them. And Lord, uh, that they would see that as the day of your any moment appearing draws nearer, that it is more important that we draw nearer to you and to one another in fellowship. And that can't be done at a distance. And so, Lord, bring us close 
bring us close to you and to each other. And I pray that you would accomplish your specific purpose in every single one of the hearers' lives today. We want Jesus again to be exalted, to be magnified as we've sung, as we talked today already. Now, Lord, speak and anoint the hearers as well as the messenger. And do it all for Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. So let's look at chapter 1 in 2 Thessalonians. And as we do so, I want you to see the first chapter is very encouraging. Look at how he he begins it in verse 2. He says, grace unto you and peace. And then in verse 3, he says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, as it's meet, because here's why. Your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity or the love, the godlike love of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. So he's encouraging them because he says, Your faith and your love are both flourishing and abounding. And that is a great blessing, he says, not only to us, but that is a great blessing to all the other churches that hear what's going on there. This church in Thessalonia is a special church. And uh, we saw that when we looked at the first letter. And it's coming out again. Even though they had, oh, churches have problems. Even though they had these problems that uh, we've already mentioned, he's thanking God for them. And uh, he's basically saying, look, I want you to be sure that despite the suffering, and you remember the Thessalonian church was suffering persecution since they trusted Jesus as their savior. They were suffering persecution probably from their own family members and also from co-workers and uh, from neighbors and, and the community that they lived in. They were suffering persecution because they became believers in Jesus. But what chapter one is telling them is I want to assure you people that despite the suffering that you are facing and sometimes extreme suffering, you need to know that it's all going to work out because you're on the winning side. You realize you're on the winning side of your believer regardless of how much you might be pictured as a loser and uh, how much you may in some way or another have to give up or sacrifice for Jesus, you're on the winning side. You're not a loser. You are a victor in Christ. And what he tells them in chapter one by way of encouragement is, boys, are you with me this morning? What he tells them is simply this. You know what? you're going to be rewarded. If you walk with me, you're going to be rewarded. And those that have persecuted you, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. God is going to reward his people, and he is going to repay those that bring suffering. It's not up to us to pay them back. God's going to do a much better job and he's going to do it the right way in the right time. And so this is the encouragement. In verses 3 to 7, I already read 3. Let's go on to verse 4. Look at the encouragement. So we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience, that is your endurance when you're persecuted, and your faith, that is you believe that God has this. He's in control. It's going to work out for your patience, your faith, and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Can I say something? That if you truly suffer persecution as a believer, and we have minor, uh, minor outbreaks of persecution here as Americans for Christ, but regardless, it has a real purifying effect upon God's people. And it has a way of making us worthy of his kingdom. And that's what he says to these folks here in that fifth verse. Verse six, and he says, 
seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Don't worry about your persecutors. I'm going to take care of them one day. Just leave it to me. That's the encouragement. And then verse 7, and to you who are being persecuted, who are troubled, relax. Rest in me. Trust me. Depend upon me. Rest with us, because when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, that's going to be a glorious day for you. So there's encouragement here. There's encouragement to believers who are suffering persecution because God is using it, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, God uses real persecution in our lives to purge us. They that suffer for the name of Jesus are being purged from the things of this earth and they are being purified that God's power can rest upon them. And not only that, Christians are encouraged here because they know, and he tells them, God's going to avenge you one day. No, don't try to get even. God, you're going to be avenged, and God's going to be the one that does it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And then uh, to the Christ rejectors, it's not encouragement, but he speaks to them in verses 8 and 9, where when he comes with his mighty angels, he's coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Basically this. And these are, this is some awesome, powerful truth that really ought to move us when we realize that the vast majority of people all around us are just this. They're Christ rejectors. And their future, if they don't, if they don't stop, if a person doesn't stop rejecting Christ, they're going to face destruction, not annihilation. <laughs> They'll still have a conscious existence in a place that is called the lake of fire, right? But they will be, he says, they will face destruction and exclusion from God's presence. And you know, the fire is one thing, but to be made as a God imager and to be forever excluded from God's presence, that is real torture as well. And this is Really, the encouragement that God gives to the people that are suffering persecution is also that he's going to take vengeance. And then look at even Jesus uh, is encouraged in that 10th verse when he, Jesus, shall come to be glorified in his saints. That's his people. He'll be glorified in his people and to be admired of all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. It's an encouragement that Jesus is going to be glorified because of his sanctifying power in human hearts and lives. You and I, as humans, in a default mode, are naturally self-centered. And self-centered people have certain characteristics, not just give me, give me, give me, and greed, but self-centered people are full of anxiety and fear because it's all about them and what's going to happen to them. And so he's saying, instead, notice first uh, uh, the verses that, uh, that follow. You become the recipients of peace, grace. Instead of self-centered, God's spirit, the Lord Jesus has sanctifying power that is transforming you into people of peace and joy that are living without guilt and without fear. That's chapter one. 
let's jump over to chapter two of this second letter to the Thessalonians. Are you with me this morning? You're taking a nap. <laughs> let's wake up. The eclipse hasn't happened yet. It's not dark. Okay, stick with me. Chapter two is enlightenment. That is, he's going to shine the light into their hearts, into their minds. He's going to show them something. And basically what he says in chapter two, you've been deceived by a forged letter you've, you've received that has said to you that the day of the Lord has already begun. Well, I'm writing this letter to you to clarify things and to assure you that when the day of the Lord begins, you'll already be out of here. You'll already be gone. It's called the rapture, right? First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. You've been given misinformation. You know why governments and people give out misinformation so that they can manipulate people to do what they want them to do. Misinformation is a way to manipulate people. And whoever wrote this letter and signed Paul's name to it, that necessitated him to have to write this second letter to that church, was trying to manipulate these people. And one way in which he, they were manipulating them is by instilling real fear in them. Look at what Paul says to them in verses 1 and 2. Now we beg you, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that's the rapture, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled by spirit nor by word, uh, probably evil spirit, <laughs> or by word, not from me, Paul says, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ, it should be the day of the Lord, is at hand, or has begun. So, Paul is bringing them enlightenment about the day of the Lord, because these people... We're really struggling with fear. See in verse 2, that phrase, shaken in mind or troubled? Well, they got this letter with this misinformation that basically was telling them, you know the persecution you're suffering? Well, guess what? It's going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. And it scared these people out of their wits. And uh, the result is that... Uh, they forgot that God was in sovereign control of their events. And as a result, they were filled with fear. You know, the earthquake that we had on Friday was nothing compared to the earthquakes that happen in other parts of the planet, mm -hmm. our world. But it may be, it may be a precursor to bigger ones. I don't know. Who knows? No one knows. But the, the, the thing that uh, perhaps we should uh, realize is that these earthquakes do not necessarily mean that the end of the world is near. But what it does mean is that we're heading in that direction. Because the Bible says that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. And so I think earthquakes are just a, an outward expression of what the Bible tells us that the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain, and they can't, the, the, the whole creation, including the earth, can't wait for the deliverance that God is going to bring. He's going to renovate this whole earth one day and make it a new earth. But uh, in the time being, we should recognize that, yeah, when these things happen, our redemption is near. <laughs> Our redemption, earthquakes should remind us, yeah, the day of redemption is getting nearer. Doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but our redemption is drawing nigh. And what ought that to do to the way that we conduct our lives? 
The thing that ought not to be happen is we ought not to be fearing. And you should never try to instill fear in other people publicly. Don't use social media to instill fear. Don't use uh, your device or or even your just your words to instill fear in God's people. We're not taught to fear circumstances. We're taught to fear God alone and depend upon him and trust in him and, and realize that we are in his hands and that his almighty hands have everything in sovereign control. Well, these people were fearing because of the day of the Lord. And so Paul writes to them and he enlightens them because they not only fear, but they've been fooled. Look at verse three again with me. And in that third verse, he says, don't let any man deceive you, fool you by any means. For that day, meaning the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment on this earth will not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. See the word deceive in verse three? It means to be, that, that, uh, that whoever wrote this letter to you, they completely got you. You know, sometimes my wife says things to me and uh, I fall for it. And she said, gotcha. <laughs> well, that's funny, but this isn't funny. They've been deceived. They've been fooled and gotcha. That's what's happened here. They've been trapped. They've been cap they've been captured. He says, don't let any man deceive you. The day of the Lord hasn't begun yet. Remember what I told you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Don't you remember that uh, you'd be gathered together unto him? And so he now begins to distinguish the day of the Lord from the rapture. And he gives some identifying features of the day of the Lord in the verses that follow. Notice, when the day of the Lord comes, there will, first of all, be a falling away. And, uh, and then, consequential to that, the man of sin, the son of perdition, will be revealed. The lawless one will be revealed. We know him. He's called in other places the Antichrist. But I want you to realize who this person is. He's described a little bit in more detail. He's one, verse 4, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The anti-Messiah, <laughs> he is, again, remember the, that uh, prefix anti, A-N-T-I, does not merely mean in place of the, uh, or, or rather uh, against, but in place of. And so this Antichrist is going to present himself as the true Messiah. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, yeah, during the, the the day of the Lord, during that seventh week of Daniel, they'll say, here's Messiah. Don't believe it. There's Messiah. Don't believe it. And Messiah, when he comes, you'll know it. He'll come with the clouds uh, of glory. Okay. He'll come riding upon the clouds, the cloud rider himself. But he says, before there is this revealing of this Antichrist, this son of perdition, there's going to be a falling away. See that? I don't like the the that term falling away, because I think it uh, gives a maybe uh, it, it uh, gives a, a misunderstanding. Uh, the words falling away simply mean a departure. There's going to be a departure. Now, folks, we'll go into greater detail when we take this book chapter by chapter. But I just want to throw this out at you in the context. I believe the falling away, the departure, if you will, in the context, 
is the rapture. And that when the church departs this earth, then this son of perdition, this man of sin will be revealed. This lawless one, this totally godless individual. And yet the world will fall at his feet for a little while. The world will embrace him fully. They will accept him because he will have a viable world peace plan that will have Israel at the center, i.e. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Remember that one? Where this man makes a peace treaty with Israel. Have you noticed how everything is heating up against Israel over the last few years, especially since the war? how they are the center of, uh, of hate and every even, can you believe the government of the United States of America is turning against Israel, our closest ally? It's amazing. Well, it's setting things up, I'm telling you. Israel is the, is the hot potato that the, this man of sin when he makes a world peace treaty, Israel will be at the center of it. But he will be revealed after the departure. And I believe, as I said, the church. And I, th I can back that up a little bit more because as we read on, in verse 5, he says, Remember you not when I was with you? I told you these things. You shouldn't be confused. I told you these things. I told you how it was going to all play out. Chapter 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 6. And you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. You know what's restraining that man of sin, that godless, lawless son of perdition. You know what's restraining him until the right time, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or restraineth, will restrain until he be taken out of the way, and then that wicked one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's Revelation 19 when that happens. But look, see the, the, the word uh, um, withholdeth in verse 6 and uh, in verse 7, Letteth or let, those three words are the same word in the original language and better translated restrain or restraineth. What is it that is restraining the lawless one and just lawlessness from just being unbridled? Well, I believe he who restrains the one who restrains is the church. And when the rapture takes place, that supreme human rebel, the son of perdition, will take power and he will promote a spirit of rebellion that will foment the greatest trouble in the history of the world. And his power in leadership is deception. So, again, we'll look more deeply in this when we get there. But look at what he says. Verse 10, he will with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this God, cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe the devil's lie, the lie of Antichrist, that they might be damned who believe not the truth, had no pleasure in uh, uh, had pleasure, rather, in unrighteousness. That's enlightenment. He's really enlightening them about the day of the Lord and the future. I don't know if you caught it, but it says in verse 4 that this Antichrist will be sitting in the temple of God. Question, is there a Jewish temple in Jerusalem standing today? There is not. Which leads me to say... There has been three temples. Solomon's temple, that uh, the Haftorah 
uh, what uh, talked about. And then the temple of uh, that was rebuilt when the people came back from Babylon and was embellished by King Herod. And uh, <clears throat> there is going to be a third temple that will be built by the unbelieving Jews. And this is the temple that he will sit in. It hasn't happened yet. There is a group in Jerusalem that's been there for many years, a group of Jewish people and leaders. It's called the Temple Institute. And they have prefabbed everything that pertains to the temple so that that temple could be erected very, very quickly once they have the go-ahead. And there's a fourth temple that, of course, Messiah will uh, sit in. And it's it, after this third one is destroyed, Messiah. And that's Ezekiel 40 to 48. That's the dimensions of the fourth temple. Okay? So anyway, just just that's a sidebar. Let's look at the third chapter, the last chapter, the last point. And this is all about, Paul's talking about enablement. What's he saying here in this third chapter? He's saying, look, whether you are suffering persecution as a Christian, living in evil times, believers living in the face of difficulty or pressures and chaos, the nearer that you get to the return of Jesus, the more important it is for you to remember you must be found faithful. Faithfulness. You remember what Jesus said after the parable of that, uh, that widow that went to the unjust judge for vengeance? He said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find the faithful? Will he find people faithful? Well, some of these people, they weren't faithful. They went to extremes. They concluded the end was near. They were in the day of the Lord. And so Jesus is going to return any moment. To, so they're going to quit their job, give up a normal life to sit it out and wait. And as a result, they put extra burden on the other people in the church. And they created a very embarrassing situation, which I already uh, pointed to in our introduction. I'm not going to go there again in verse 6 and verse 11 of this third chapter. But if I could just sum it up, the third chapter is this. Don't worry about the difficulties and the pressure and the chaos that may be on the increase as the days grow later. Don't worry because God supplies his people all the necessary all the necessary spiritual resources to live the believing life and while you're at it please warn your brothers who have quit their job to fulfill their responsibility by being faithful and occupying till Jesus comes that's really what chapter 3 is all about he says in verse 1, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God may have free course, be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all have not the faith, but God's faithful, and he'll establish you, and he'll keep you from evil, and we have confidence in the Lord, verse 4, touching you, that, 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 both, uh, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you, and the Lord will direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Three truths to take away from these three chapters. You ready? The first one is this. Regardless of whatever a person suffers for Christ, don't ever lose heart, because whatever you suffer for Christ, it'll never be in vain. Because Jesus sees, he knows, he's going to reward you, and he's going to pay back those that persecute you. Number two, God's people are to be the restrainers, if you will, of rebellion in society by their own personal surrender to Christ, to the will of God. And then they can function as the light and salt in their community. You know the best way to function as light and salt? 
before you ever open your mouth and say a word, get on your face, get on your knees, get on your face before God and cry out on the behalf of the people that you live amongst. And as I said, be fully surrendered to the Lord. You know what? I don't know what the percentage is, but I would say that there is a very, very small percentage of people in this room or that will be listening on the internet sometime to this message that are totally surrendered to God. Some are partially surrendered, but very, very few believers are totally surrendered to God because we all have our agendas and we all do what we want to do. And that's just the way it is. But if you, if you want to accomplish what God tends, uh, intends for you to accomplish, you have to be totally surrendered to him. If you think you are, God will test you. And the third takeaway from our time this morning is non, no one can claim that it is impossible to live for the Lord in evil times. That's not true. That's just not accurate. Because God made adequate provision for you and me to obey him. First of all, he's given us his very self present with us all the time. And his presence in us is him himself being our life living his life in us. And thus, we can take the grace of God that is available all the time and is always sufficient. So no one, no believer can claim that it's impossible to live for Jesus because it's too evil today. That is the devil's lie. That is an excuse, a human excuse. And you need to just negate it. I may have used this illustration before, but it's a true one, and it's a powerful one. Back in the days when Russia was called the Soviet Union, as you know, many pastors were arrested and were imprisoned. And one particular pastor was arrested, and he was sent to prison while his wife and his children were sent to live or die, for that matter, way out in Siberia somewhere. And one extremely cold winter night in their remote, dilapidated uh, wooden cabin, these children with their mother divided the family's last crust of bread between them and drank their last cup of tea before they crawled into their bed hungry that night. And kneeling to pray, they asked their mom where they were going to get more food. They said, you know, our father probably doesn't even know where we're living now. And their mother answered the children and said, yes, but our heavenly father knows. And uh, he's going to provide. So let's pray and let's ask him for his provision. About 20 miles away, in the middle of the night, God woke up a church deacon out of a deep sleep and told him to get out of bed, harness his horse, hitch his horse to the sled, and uh, go by the church and pick up uh, the, the vegetables that they had left over and any meat and food products and take it to this family. And the deacon said, but God, I can't do that. It's, it's below zero, and the horse and I will freeze to death. The Holy Spirit told him he had to go because this family was in trouble. And he argued again with the Lord. He said, but Lord, there are, there are wolves out there, and they're going to attack and devour both my horse and myself, and I may not make it back. You know what the deacon said? God told him, I just told you to go. I didn't say you had to make it back. When he got to the cabin in the middle of the night, in the early pre-dawn hours, he knocked on the, the door of that rickety cabin 
And of course, his banging probably frightened the mother and kids who were asleep. But imagine the joy and the amazement when they open the door and they see this guy with a huge sack of food uh, offering them off of his sleigh. And they look at the sleigh and it's just filled with the food as well that the church had collected. And he told them, when this runs out, I'll bring more. But the thing that really struck me, and I think we ought to remember, is what God told that man. You don't have to come back. You just have to go. Folks, this is what life really is about as a believer. It's not about your survival. It's not about you. It's about the will of God. And that, my friend, is a picture of total surrender. Where you are willing to put your life on the line, if need be, in order to do the will of God. That's why I said there's very few, percentage-wise, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and sitting here today that are totally surrendered to the Lord because not many of us would be willing to put our lives on the line in order to do God's will. But that's what total surrender looks like. And that's what's required of believers. And that's why parents don't, uh, that's why parents don't hold back children from going to dangerous mission fields with the gospel because they realize that they don't have to come back. They need just to go. They just need to obey the will of God. Until we get that settled in our heart, I think we're probably just fooling ourselves as to where we are as spiritual believers, as Christians.